Vince Taylor was this nightmare of a guy right out of his tree I mean he was playing with Arthur Deck I mean this guy was bonkers absolutely the genuine article I can't remember if he said he was an alien or the son of God but it might have been a bit of both gone on stage without his band but dressed in white robes and told everybody that indeed he was the coming messiah. Early 60s rocker Vince Taylor was a true showman. From the crest of his pompadour to the toes of his pointy shoes, dressed in black leather pants and shirt with a large medallion bouncing off his chest, Taylor shimmied and shook across stages in London and Paris where he gained his greatest fame. Oh, Jesus Christ, who is this geezer? He's going to smash the place to pieces. and rubbery dancer, he tossed his microphone stand with controlled abandon. A bicycle chain gripped in one of his black-gloved hands added to an aura of menacing cool. An American accent further marked Taylor as the real deal to kids who viewed the United States as home of all things gloriously rock and roll. Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Eddie Cochran, and of course, Elvis Presley. Taylor was in top form in 1962. Those who saw him perform in those times will remember a good-looking guy with an air of a hooligan, dressed in black leather from head to toe, with chains wrapped around his leather gloves, and an exaggerated pompadour. He also seemed a bit extreme for the times, with the eyeliner and makeup, including light applications of lipstick. On stage, the band thundered with powerful rock and roll as Vince screamed and howled like a man possessed, squirming, gyrating intensely, attacking stage columns, roaring, often spending much time laying on the stage in fits similar to wildly suggestive and even epileptic-like spasms. Four years later, Vince had almost gone. Not dead, just gone. Sounds like the brand new Cadillac of 1959 seemed a thing of the past while he himself had become a grimy junkie. Dressed in a red robe, calling himself Matthews after the bottle of wine he had consumed during his first soul-shattering LSD trip. Roaming the parks and streets, preaching the gospel of the alien agenda or a secret buried treasure to the patrons of the bars of London, the entire time in his new persona appearing as Matthews or the new Christ. All that transpired in Vince Taylor's mind is not known, but what was witnessed by the public was what became the legend of Vince Taylor. Acid Casualty Vince Taylor. Rock and Roll Suicide, Vince Taylor. Vince Taylor, the true manifestation of Ziggy Stardust in the flesh. As however brief the rise and fall of Vince Taylor, he has surely left his mark. The story, the myth, the rise and fall inspired David Bowie to create Ziggy Stardust. And also Joe Strummer, whose version of Brand New Cadillac with The Clash, he was quoted as saying, Vince Taylor was the beginning of British rock and roll. Before him, there was nothing. He was a miracle. Vince Taylor was actually born Brian Maurice Holden. 
the youngest of five siblings, the whole family emigrated from Britain to the United States in 1946. In 1954, his sister Sheila was working in Hollywood, where she met and later married Joe Barbera, who shortly afterwards became famous as half of the duo Hannah Barbera, the cartoon creators. By 1958, young Vince was already singing in nightclubs in Los Angeles and loosely constructed his plan. With his good looks and ways of a rocker, his plan was to return to England and blow up the London stage. His brother, the cartoon and entertainment mogul, Joe Barbera, supported him. And after the success of the cartoons like Huckleberry Hound, which began airing on TV in 1958, Joe happily financed the entry of Vince Taylor into the world of rock and roll. Vince had told his family that he had heard an album of Tony Steele, and he thought that if this was rock and roll in England, then their version would be a storm. So with his guitarist, Bob Friedberg, and his manager, Joe Singer, they moved to London. The first thing they did was to find suitable sites for what they wanted to do. After settling in, a waiter told them that there was a bar in Soho called the Two Eyes. Now, the Two Eyes was the club that was also the launching pad for Tony Steele's career. He had become a star, he had ascended, and in doing so, Tommy Steele had left a well-oiled rock band in desperate need of a lead singer. Ultimately, despite being slightly below average, Singer Vince Taylor took advantage, but at the same time, he rocked so hard that he really made an impact on the audience. And it certainly didn't hurt. He let everyone know the impression that it was all American deal here. In essence, he was an Englishman, born Brian Maurice Holden. Then he legally changed his real name for the sake of a stage persona by grafting Gene Vincent, together with actor Robert Taylor, into the rock god Vince Taylor. For those who actually knew the truth, the long-haired, tough guy rock and roller told the few that were in the know that as Elvis Presley was so big in the USA, there simply wasn't room enough for the both of them. So Vince had come to England. Now, he, as he was actually a very limited singer, did not have a very good voice, and did not sing so finely tuned, rather even having difficulty with timing issues as well. Ultimately, his magnetism and outrageous stage antics outshone all earthly limitations, as his ambition was even greater than his magnetism, and his raucous and suggestive assaults to the stage eclipsed any vocal limitations. Vince named his band the Playboys, and as they became more famous, changing up for more skilled musicians, playing better venues and halls, and ultimately after intensive testing and auditioning for EMI, Vince Taylor finally got the record deal. The first single was not very successful, although between December 58 and January 59, Vince and his band appeared three times on Oh Boy, which was a famous musical television show at the time. With the second single, things were much better for Vince and the Playboys. Published in April of 59, it contained the first of his original compositions titled Brand New Cadillac. And while this song was used for a B-side to put header rather a sappy version of Pledging My Love by Johnny Ace, the Brand New Cadillac was recognized over subsequent years as one of the defining moments of rock and roll in England. Along with Shaking All Over, Johnny Kidd, and Move Cliff Richard. With the success came trouble, as ultimately deeper issues may already have been at work in Taylor's psyche. He was notoriously unreliable and pathologically jealous. Skipping gigs to check on whereabouts of girlfriends was one of the many issues beginning to pile up on the shoulders of his bandmates. The Playboys were a good band, but among its members, there was chemistry. Tony Sheridan and Vince Taylor had worked hard to get through, but as two huge egos, there were many disputes between the two which were also extended to the others. Tony Sheridan wanted to dominate everything. Eventually it became very irritating to always have to moderate the many disputes manifesting between all the parties. Some of the band members ultimately had better offers from other bands. Finally, after an appearance on a BBC program, the Playboys were painfully dissolved. 
By March, he was back in England training new Playboys, playing a concert tribute to Eddie Cochran, and signing a new record deal, this time with Palette, a Belgian label that had distribution in England, with whom they had released their third single in August. That song was I'll Be Your Hero, slightly country ditty, leaving the strong rocker to the B-side with Jet Black Machine. This album sold enough copies itself, but as he moved upward artistically, his behavior became less stable. He started to leave without giving the concerts. Before going, he phoned his girlfriend to make sure she would be there. If she was not, or if she was leaving before the end, Vince jumped off the stage and went to his car to fetch her. Incredibly, this was done several times, although it is worth stating, this did not go over especially well with the new components of the Playboys, to the point that a fight erupted with guitarist Tony Harvey. When going to a concert outside London, ending with more dangerous silliness of Tony pulling Vince out the window of a moving train. There were a few months of relative stability, and the group had earned notoriety among the European rock and roll scene. Typically, Vince performed all of his best shows in Paris. During those shows, he performed in the most savage way he could, appearing dressed in all black leather with chains around his arms and makeup. When the perf saw that, immediately they placed him at headlining position. On August 15th began a new contract with a major label, Barclay, including booking performances in the heart of the French Riviera. Vince took to this stardom the fallen so seriously that from the airport to the hall, he was seen traveling standing with his head out the sunroof of the limousine. Besides the riots that broke out on November 18th at the Stars of Rock Festival at the Palais de Sports in Paris. On the way out, they'd smashed all the telegraph poles out, they'd overturned cars, you'd never seen a wreck before. And uh, after then, we did a 21-day Belgium tour. And before we even started the tour, we had three shows cancelled, finished. And the reason for that is we don't want Vince Sadder in this theatre. He's going to wreck the place. You know, we can't afford him smashing up seats and everything like that. So when we got back, Barclay said, look, look, Vince, your image is getting out of hand, the black devil of rock. There were other, more troublesome personal issues beginning to manifest themselves. The broken chairs, fights around every corner, police detaining anyone who they could catch. Vince sat and watched as the TV cameras that were filming the event focused on him as he pleaded with the rioting public, trying to calm things down. The next day, newspapers showed him in the middle of the wreckage caused by the unruly crowd. This could also be viewed as a metaphor for what was going on behind closed doors, as Vince was beginning to show signs, serious signs, of what was about to come. Every night, they went to the best restaurants and nightclubs of Paris, where they identified themselves as stars, and what was offered to them was only the finest. But what the public did not know was his alcoholism, coupled with his addiction to speed and preludin, which was a chemical stimulant that was abused when speed was not in circulation. This addiction was in fact the deadly fuel required to fire up the jet black leather machine, and the cracks were beginning to show to people close enough to Vince Taylor to realize his superhuman rocker god antics and stage powers certainly had less to do with the Joan of Arc medallion he had purchased at the airport immediately upon his arrival in Europe, but actually more to do with the copious amounts of speed, preludin, and alcohol Mr. Taylor was putting down, and the constant abuse began taking its toll. Vince sometimes could not even remember who had already taken the stage. Just a few minutes after getting off of the stage, he wasn't sure if he had even performed. The straw that broke the camel's back was an incident with a Belgian biker club, who did not appreciate an upstart like Vince Taylor getting away with his usual antics, as the biker club corralled them off during one of the performances, and the police had to intervene. Vince Taylor was back in the news once again. On May 22nd of 1962, Vince and the Playboys had a concert scheduled 
at the Locomotive in Paris to welcome Joe Barbera and Vince's sister, Sheila, whom the couple met upon their arrival was not Vince Taylor. He had gone to London to get paid, an attempt to settle up on concerts they had already performed, but never actually received payment, as at the time, Playboys were hurting for cash. When he left, he had sworn he would be back in time for the show at the Locomotive. He fulfilled this promise partially. Who actually returned was someone, but it certainly was not Vince Taylor. The door opens, Vince Taylor walks in. My God. His shoes were absolutely filthy. He'd got long hair. And he hadn't combed it for about a week. Come in, he hadn't shaved for a couple of days. And he was carrying in his arm this roll of uh, material. And it was like uh, pu a purple, satiny coloured material. And he was all sit sitting around. And he just walks in. And we knew something was wrong. He just looked at us, he said. You think I'm Vince Taylor, don't you? Well, I'm not. He says, my name is Matthews. I'm the son of Jesus Christ. And he had a bottle of wine in his hand, a bottle of Matthews wine. He had a bottle of pills in his pocket. And he's died down a bit, so he said, right, Vince, you know, we've got a gig tonight, don't you? Oh, yes, yes, that's why I'm back. That's why I'm back, he said, that's why I'm back. But uh, just a minute, we're sorry to ask you this, Vince, but you went to get us some money, right? The hotel bill, we haven't eaten for three days, like we're starving. Like, please, you know, have you got any money? You've got the money. That's all you guys are interested in, isn't it? Money. Money. Don't need money. Money. Yes, I've got some money, he said. Yes, I've got some money. Where is it? Jeez. I'm Jesus Christ. He said, you know what I think about money? I'll show you what I think about money. And he lit all the money. I said, Vince, what are you doing? Shall I like the money? He said, money's not important. It's God that's important, not money. And he threw it on the floor. And it was all burning on the floor, burning the carpet. <laughs> Next morning, we got up. Vince comes downstairs. Oh, he's combed his hair and he's shaved, cleaned his shoes, got his black leather gear on. Comes down, normal as anything. So off we go, oh, thank God Vince is all right. So off we go down the door. There's a poster outside the door. So as we're walking in, Vince looks at that, takes out one of these uh, felt pens out of his pocket, crosses out Vince Taylor and writes Matthews. And we went, oh my God, here he goes again. Anyway, walks in, just a bit of black leather, bit of, bit of makeup up, lovely. And he always had a big jug of water, and it was water. So we started off, dun, 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 come on everybody. Dun, 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 dun. Now you just keep on going till he, he's ready to come in. So he comes out on stage and gets this glass of water in his hands. And... Then he walks off the stage and he walks into the audience. And it's not a seated audience, so they're, they're sitting, on the, uh, sitting on, the, on the floor. And he walks on to every single person. Water in his hand. God bless you, my son. God bless you, my son. God bless you. 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 Bless you, my son. Bless you. He'd gone on stage without his band, but dressed in white robes and told everybody that indeed he was the coming messiah. And he just got booed off. I mean, they just went mad and it was like the end of his career. A few years later, I was walking along Old Compton Street and I heard somebody saying, I'm Jesus, I'm Jesus Christ, I'm Jesus. And I looked across the road and I saw this guy with this black beard. And I looked again, and it was Vince, Vince Taylor. And that one day, I remember on Tottenham Court Road, he dragged out this world map, and we were crouching on all fours outside Tottenham Court Road tube station. And uh, he was showing me where all the aliens had their bases throughout the, under the Arctic and like in this mountain. <laughs> and there's people stepping over our map, and I think, what the hell am I doing in the middle of Russia with this bonkers American looking at the map of the world? And he's telling me, and I thought, there's something in this. I'm going to remember this. <laughs> this is just too good. So Vince Taylor really became very much one of the building blocks of the Ziggy character. You know, it was, uh, 
I just thought he was just too good to be true. He was of another world. He was from somewhere else. And he was definitely part of the blueprint of this strange character that came from somewhere. Like So what had happened to Vince Taylor? Who was this Matthew, Son of God character? And why was the jet black machine now adorned in flowing purple robes? Days later, the band found out that Vince had been in London, but he had ended up at a party in honor of Bob Dylan, where he had taken LSD for the first time in his life. He liked the experience, and someone at this party managed to help him buy $200 worth of the drug. Reports claim to the purity and strength of this particular batch of LSD as it had been concocted specifically for Bob Dylan in an effort to help expand the influential singer-songwriter's consciousness. Previous reports of an intensely powerful, severe reaction to smoking a single marijuana cigarette point towards the possibility of perhaps Taylor having some sort of allergic or extra-sensitive constitution, as after he ingested the small amount of marijuana, he had an extreme reaction. As there are reports, he was telling people he had become an airplane. Upon taking his first LSD dose, Vince did not stop taking the acid. He reportedly had been tripping nonstop for several days, close to a full week, when he finally returned to Paris and met the band at the hotel. Under the effects of LSD, he came to the club Locomotive, anointing the crowd and giving sips of the wine bottle to the audience. His sister, Sheila, being amongst the crowd, was very frightened. When asked what had happened, her brother's answer was, I'm not Vince, I am the son of God. And he began to pray and then fly into a rage for no reason. As the night went on, Vince left the stage area and wandered out into the street, randomly anointing strangers and praying loudly to God as he headed towards the Seine River with a crowd of about 20 enthusiastic followers and witness of this spectacle. Later at the hotel, he had told everyone that they must return to California. He said, there will be a plane ready on the runway at midnight and the pilot will be God. I am the son of God. I will take you flying everyone to Hollywood. Eventually, as his issues overcame him, sanity prevailed as Sheila brought news that after speaking with him at length, Vince had agreed to seek psychiatric care. And basically, that was the end of Vince Taylor. You guys, thank you for watching this video. Quotes in the beginning of the video, we are aware that David Bowie did meet him. Vince Taylor was this nightmare of a guy. He was uh, an American expatriate who had some small degree of success on English television on, on probably shows like 6-5 Special or Oh Boy Jack Good type shows. I, I remember him being in around in that. There were Dickie Pride and Adam Faith and Vince Eager. There's the other Vince, yeah. Yeah, there was kind of this, you know, motley crew of English would-be Elvises that were... There was hundreds of them. All of them were Elvis. You got your Elvis A, B, C or D. You know, you want one with a light suit or a dark suit. They were all on the same show and Cliff was the leader of the Elvises. And he was one of them, probably the most authentic of the lot, in as much as he was at least American, so the accent was correct, but his, his music was pretty pony. Um, people knew about Vince Taylor because... He was kind of like the raving town lunatic for a long time, and uh, it was a, it was a sad case. This is out of all of these cases that I'm going to be making videos out of. I'm going to go ahead and say this guy, he is the number one acid casualty. <laughs> I know I said that about Sid Barrett uh, in the first video, uh, but thinking about this case with Vince and what happened to him. It really points toward a reaction, you know, that this trip that he went on was specifically what broke him. Now, did he have a propensity? Did he have a weakness? Was this part of his psyche? Um, who knows? Nobody knows. 
you know, and that's the thing. But uh, like I said, uh, pretty much after that, Barclay Records was trying to salvage some of the wreckage. Uh, they edited the last sessions and added noise, like, uh, you know, concert noise. So there was this uh, quote unquote live album came out in July of 1967. Uh, there was an attempt of a tour, but this proved a tremendous failure as Vince sang for 15 minutes and left the stage. Vince had not changed for the better. With the makeup, Osley, he appears more like a zombie than a rocker as time went on. Reports of him sitting around uh, for hours in silence, perhaps contemplating what he had done or perhaps communicating with God or the aliens. He didn't eat much. He merely kind of sat there and stared blankly. All he did was get up at about 10 o'clock. He would eat breakfast. He would sit there uh, with an omelet in front of him and basically not, not even eat that, sit there and think. Uh, as the day went on, he would order some lunch and then order some dinner and sit and not leave the table. This went on for about a year. When he stopped thinking, he spent the next four years in London, from bar to bar, subsiding on wine, acid, speed, tortillas, and religious visions. His reality had completely shifted as he passed the line completely between the rocker Matthews to the Son of God. Apocryphal stories of psychedelic London in the late 60s spoke of a raving Vince Taylor, the intoxicated madman who whinnied like a horse, giving sermons dressed in a white robe, declaring himself as Jesus Christ, the resurrection, and encouraging people to mutiny wherever he went. Unconfirmed rumors of Vince getting involved with violent characters from the underworld of the city. Even French sources, perhaps more reliable, talking about Vince checking in and then out of psychiatric clinics and resting until he had another failed comeback attempt in Paris in 1972. In the early days after his initial breakdown, the story is kind of varied and not that clear. There's a lot of rumors about what was going on with Vince. But as time progresses, we see failed comeback attempts in 72, 76, 77. None of those have produced anything worth noting. Uh, there was the forgettable, horrific live album and a handful of sad music video shoots. He just looks awful. You know, that's what I'll say. He was continuing with the makeup more often than not when you see video of him. And uh, there's no other way of putting this. He just, he scares me. He's, he's kind of a scary looking guy uh, to begin with, with all the leather and all that, and just how he looked with the massive pompadour. But I'll tell you what, after he flipped out and started piling on the makeup and the years weren't very kind to Vince Taylor, he is one scary looking old rocker. In 1983, he married Natalie Minster and moved with her to Switzerland. 1987, he was cured of his alcoholism as he spent six months in a detox center in Montreal. After 1987, he led a quiet life, sometimes appearing, singing in small Swiss clubs. And after three grueling months in a hospital, Vince Taylor died of cancer on August 27, 1991. There are reports of him working as an airplane mechanic in Switzerland. Similar tales have the job title shifted towards janitorial duties. Which is something, considering the fact he did have an aviation training and some sort of a pilot's license, which he had obtained while living in the United States. We may never know the truth about whether or not an LSD trip can permanently fry a human being or affect them on that deep of a level as we see in some of these cases. I would like to point out that the title of the series is actually extremely sensationalistic. But consider this, what was I supposed to call it? Musicians or singers who struggled with mental illness issues that may have been aggravated by the use of psychedelics? I just want to say in this case with Vince Taylor, I see a fragile human being. Sure, the way he acted, his alter ego or stage persona was that of a rock and roll madman. I think deep inside Vince Taylor was a fragile human being with a love for life. Perhaps an insecure human being. Maybe he struggled with being honest with himself. 
I'm going to go out on a limb and say his personality seems like he leans toward addiction. These sorts of personality who go to extremes and abuse substances that are readily available may not find a pleasant experience through a powerful entheogen such as LSD. And I find it striking when he did see the light or have this drug-induced breakdown or suffer this long-term psychosis due to the use of this LSD that he found peace in believing that he was in fact a holy man almost the extreme opposite of the black devil rocker he had been emulating or summoning for so many years. I see Vince Taylor as a beautifully flawed human being. He's a walking contradiction. But that's how I see all human beings, including myself. Is there irony to be found in the duality of men, or should we expect that? Should we prepare and be ready for that? Personally, I like to try and discover profound beauty that can be found to exist in music. The question being, can truth be found through the exploration of these mediums? Well, I would like to think so. My truth and beauty certainly can. It just gets a little confusing when we have to dress it up, when we need to play pretend. Things like dress up or even lyrics can have a real impact for me personally. Ultimately, I'm going to say that Vince Taylor may have done a little better if he would have chosen his path for reasons other than financial motivations. It is not for me to judge someone for how they choose to live their life, but if a person puts themselves out there as a celebrity, I feel it gives me the right to go ahead and say what I do not see Vince Taylor as a successful artist, nor do I find any truth or beauty in what he created. To be honest, he seemed more like a cut-right Elvis Presley wannabe. I wouldn't spend a dime on one of his records, but what I would pay to go back in time and have a conversation with Matthews the Son of God. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, episode 2 of Acid Casualties. I am PD Two Finger. As a responsible, I'm getting a little bit older now. I'm getting close to 50, and my path that I'm working towards in my life is an addictionless path. It's more of a clean path that's healthy as I get older. I'm certainly not pro-drug or anti-drug. I am the type of person that feels if you are a responsible adult to choose what you would like to put in your body, but I also don't want to see anyone suffer. And I also understand the horror of addiction. Um, I just had kind of got attacked about the title of the series, and I wanted to just voice a little bit more of my opinion and tell a little bit more of who I am that I'm not, um, I'm not some sort of person that's up here on a soapbox saying how evil everything is. It's kind of the opposite. If you knew me, you probably would dig me because I'm a decent human being and I try. I hope you will join me for episode three. PD Two Fingers saying, enjoy your summer. I'm going to be here keeping cool with my buddy Augustus, my little black cat. He's sitting here with me right now. Yes, you go boy, Christy. I'll get you a tweet, huh? You guys, thanks again. Peace. I'm in a rock and roll session. And I'm waiting for Michael. Who's not here. Brand new Cadillac. Gross middle. Schwepp. Do you remember? It was 1959. The Observatory. What a strange story. Rock and roll session is a session where we can do what we want to do. Schwepp. Gross, we don't. Jack's bicycle is music. Gross, Muldoon. What? Everything is possible. Possible. Rock and roll station is the second pirate session of a strange wax. Gross module. Listening. Listening to an outlaw rock and roll station. Outlaw. Outlaw.
I'm in a rock and roll station and I'm waiting for Michael, who's not here. Brand new Cadillac, do you remember? It was 1959 in the observatory. What a strange story. Rock and roll station is a station where we can do what we want to do. Schwa. Jack's bicycle is music to my ears. Everything is possible. Possible? Rock and roll session is a second pirate session of a strange wax. Gross modul. Gross modul. Listening. Listening to a rock and roll session is to be. Is to be. I'm in a rock and roll session and I'm waiting for Mike. He's not here. Schwab. Brand new Cadillac. Do you remember? It was in 1959. What a strange story. The observatory. Rock and roll station is a station where we can do what we want to do. Jack's bicycle is music to my ears. Everything is possible. Possible. Schweb. Rock and roll session is the second pirate session of a strange wax. Listening to the rock and roll session, outlaw, outlaw, is to be outlaw. I'm in a gross noodle and I'm waiting for a rock and roll station. Schwet. Who he's not here. It was in 1959. I'm in a rock and roll station, and I'm waiting for a gross module. A rock and roll station is a station where we can do what we want to do. But hang on, Jack's bicycle. Do you remember? I'm in a rock and roll station, and I'm waiting for Michael. Who? He's not here. Brand new Cadillac. Jack's bicycle is music to my ears. Everything is possible. A rock and roll station is a second pirate station of a strange wax. But I'm listening. I'm listening to a rock and roll station. Outlaw. Outlaw.